Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Ray, and welcome to the RayWendelik.com podcast. In this podcast, we'll keep you up to date with the latest app development tech talk. Now, here are your hosts, Drew Freeman and Jen Bailey. Thanks, Ray. This is the Ray Wenderlich podcast. Welcome to episode five for season nine. This episode was recorded on Saturday, the 25th of May, 2019 for broadcast on the 12th of June, 2019. And that means you know what happens at WWDC, but we don't. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Triple Byte. That's Byte, B-Y-T-E. I'm Drew Freeman, here with my ever effervescent season nine co-host, Jen Bailey. Thanks, Drew. On this episode, we are talking with John Sundell. John builds apps, games, and developer tools. He also makes Swift by Sundell, a series of weekly articles and a podcast about Swift development and co-hosts the Stack Trace podcast. He has worked for companies like Volvo and Spotify and is now working full-time on creating apps, tools, and content for the Swift community. John also fancies himself an amateur chef. In this episode, John is going to take us through the world of unit and UI testing and even a mention of the good, the bad, and the ugly of third-party frameworks. Then, in the second half, I'll talk about UX design, pitfalls, things non-devs tend to miss, and how to make a better connection as a developer with your team. John, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. It's really, really exciting to be here. So thanks so much for having me on the show. So I'm going to start with the most important thing on your entire list, amateur chef. Of course. Yeah, that's the absolute most important one. <laughs> yeah, like for me, cooking is so important. Like there's this thing, the saying that you either live to eat or you eat to live, right? <laughs> and yeah. I definitely live to eat. <laughs> like <laughs> eating and cooking and all things food is one of my main interests. And it's also a great way for me to relax after like a full intense day of coding or writing or podcasting to just go to the kitchen and prepare a meal and enjoy it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I always try to say, you know, to the people who come on the show or I talk to and I'm like, so you're a coder and what do you do for fun? And they're like, I code. I'm like, no, right. <laughs> you're not coding. And it got to me, it was like, so I started doing podcasts, but now the podcasting is like coding. So there's always got to be that something that steps you away from that grind. Yeah, absolutely. You need something to break the routine, if you will. So whatever your routine is, if your day job is, you know, accounting or if it's coding or if it's podcasting, writing, you need something to break that routine and to do something completely different just to enable you to shut your brain off a little bit and to reflect and to uh, really just relax, like be in a state where you're not just trying to solve the next algorithmic problem, <laughs> but you're trying to instead, you know, chop up your vegetables and get the meat cooked right. <laughs> so I have to ask everyone who likes to be a chef, um, how do you like your eggs? Ooh, that's a good one. I like the <laughs> hard boiled actually. And uh, I know that they lose some flavor in doing that, but I just, I'm not a fan of like gooey food, you know, like food that has this like gooey consistency. Like I, I like things that are more uh, firm in their consistency or that are more like soup, you know, in between, not so much. That's interesting. <laughs> See, that's when very I, interesting. When I have somebody else make me eggs, I get them over easy. Oh, right. But when I make them myself, I make them scrambled because I love the spicing and the act of just putting it all together and, and, and I actually don't like eating anybody else's scrambled eggs unless I've, I've had the time to put them together myself. Right. Yeah, there's something about eggs that just makes it, there's so many permutations of it, right? And you can really have strong opinions about your eggs, which is pretty interesting for such a basic piece of food. <laughs> very true. Definitely. I'm very particular about my eggs. <laughs> let's, let's hop off of basic and let's talk about Swift. I, I love the Swift by Sundell site. They're just, it, it, the writing style itself is just so friendly and, and basically comes out and says, look, you know this and we know this, but let's take a look at it this way. And it's a really nice way to, to edge the, uh, the reader into the technical concepts. Thank you so much. Uh, it means a lot to hear that because it is something that I put quite a lot of energy into the, the tone of the articles. And it's something also that has developed over time. Like when I started, I was obviously a much, much more inexperienced writer. Uh, I was definitely an amateur writer back then, right? I was 
in the same state as I am now with my cooking. <laughs> uh, yeah. But over time, I've kind of found my own style. And uh, one thing that has been really important to me throughout has been to to not be too you know, strongly opinionated, to not push things too hard, but to rather just say, you know, here's this technique. Let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at the pros and cons. Let's do it together, like you said. And let's use the we form instead of the I form when I'm talking about things. Like we're, it's like we're doing it together, all, all of me and all the readers in the community. We're taking a look at this thing. Let's see how it works and what we can do with it. And it's a good mix of um, beginner as well as advanced topics. You don't shy away from some of the harder topics, but at the same time, I was uh, looking yesterday at your article on designing Swift APIs, where you basically say, yeah, let's talk about designing Swift APIs, but remember, every time you write code, that's what you're doing. Right, exactly. I usually say everyone is an API designer. That is a little bit of a tagline that I've had going on. Uh, and I really believe that's true. Like, uh, no matter if you are writing an app, like just with a small team, if you're working in a big company, if you're vending frameworks, or if you're working on open source, whichever context you're writing code in, you are at some point writing code for other people. And I know that's something you discussed with Erica, Erica Sadoon on the previous episode, that you know, you don't only write code for the compiler, right? You write code for humans as well. And having those really nice APIs that are easy and nice to read really just makes everything more fluent and nice when you are working with the code as a human, not only as a compiler. Yeah, it's been a very good season that we had Erica talk about writing not only for other people, but writing for yourself for when you come back to it, because heavens knows we put code down for six months, 12 months or worse. And then we come back to it and we don't know what the programmer was doing. And that programmer was us to begin with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so incredibly common to do like a git blame or something only to find your own name there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I think that's also great. It means also that we're kind of um, developing as, as developers and as people, like we're learning new skills. And sometimes uh, the things that we were doing in the past, like gives us that, what was I thinking moment? But it just means that, we have just evolved to, to learning new things and new techniques that we can then uh, deploy. Uh, but of course, that, that requires us to also be able to understand what past you actually was thinking. So you're definitely right, I think, in that you're also writing for yourself in the future. That could be another person you're also targeting with your code and your APIs. So do you have a recent article that you wrote that you're really happy with? The one you mentioned about API design uh, is definitely one that I wanted to write for a long time and I finally got to do it. And I'm definitely very happy about that article. I also wrote an article uh, about a month ago or something like that called Bindable Values in Swift. And I'm very happy about that one too because it goes through some of the principles of uh, functional reactive programming or reactive programming in general, uh, where people tend to d immediately jump through these big frameworks in order to get some of those patterns in place. And with that article, I really want to show that, not that I'm saying that you should never use some of those big frameworks, but rather that if you are just looking for one specific part of them or one specific pattern, you can actually implement that using not that many lines of code. And that's, that's a bit of a red thread, I guess, throughout my article series, uh, which is now up to 118 weeks of writing. So it's Oof. been a while. <laughs> uh, and uh, the red thread, I guess, is that, you know, I don't write articles that are about like, hey, here's this framework that you can just it, it put in your code and it's going to be great. But it's about what's underneath, like what's the underlying principles, what's the patterns, like that's what I wanted to look at. And that's a good example of that, I think, with bindable values in Swift, where I'm looking at the core principles of some of those reactive frameworks and how you can bind values to your UI, but doing it in a, in a completely like straightforward way without dependencies. Yeah, I appreciate that concept of not necessarily going into the big framework. As I talked about on a previous show, I was handed a bunch of code where the, uh, the previous developers had used Moya, but they'd basically used Moya for about, oh, two to 5% of what Moya is good for. And I spent the better part of a, a month ripping Moya out of that entire code because it was just dross. It, it really wasn't necessary and other methods could be used that would reduce the footprint. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely something to be said for using the right tool for the right job mm -hmm. where, 
all these frameworks that exist that are popular and big, like they're great. Like they are, they are really well made. They have great test coverage, like we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, they are, uh, they are made by the community, many contributors, people, you know, people really like them, but they are made for a specific context. And if your project does not fit that context, then it's kind of a mismatch, right? And to your point there, like Moya, I think is a, is a great example of a really, really good networking library, like really well-made, great APIs and things like that, but it's also a big framework. It does a lot of things. So if you only need to make like one or two GET requests, you know, you can use URL session, the built-in API, and that'll be completely fine. It will do everything that you need, and you can save yourself having to maintain that dependency. Oh, yeah. So let's actually turn to the world of unit testing and UI testing. Um, a colleague once said to me, for every line of code you write in an application, you need 20 to 50 lines of unit test code. Oh, wow. <laughs> that I'm sounds like saying, a lot. I'm not saying that my colleague was right. I'm saying that my colleague said this once, and we'll just leave it at that. Right. It is a very common thing, though, that people tend to throw out these numbers or these principles or rules or even laws, right, where they say, you, in order to use testing, you need to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, it can be anything from you need to use TDD, test-driven development, and always write your tests first. You need to always have 100% test coverage. Or like your former colleague said, you always need to have this ratio between production code and test code. And I tend to take a little bit of a different approach uh, to testing. I am not a huge fan of TDD per se, although I use it for some tasks, like I'm sure we're gonna get into. Uh, but I do believe that testing is a really, really great tool to use. But I also think that all those rules and laws that, that sometimes get thrown around can sometimes be damaging when we are thinking about testing. And a lot of people get this impression that in order to start testing, I need to go through this enormous process of learning all these different things and it's such a huge deal while it doesn't have to be it can be so much more lightweight and you can get started much much easier yeah, yes I'm, how do you recommend someone what's a first step to get started with testing i think a good step is to identify pieces of code that you have that are somewhat isolated maybe not in terms of how they're implemented right now but conceptually isolated so let's take an example. Let's say that we're working on, a, on an app that uh, is an e-commerce app. Like it has a shopping cart where you put products in. And this shopping cart has a method that lets you apply a coupon code. So you can say, okay, I have this coupon code and it's going to apply this amount of discount. This is a perfect function that you can start unit testing. You can just create your shopping cart, put some products in it, give it a coupon code, and then you can assert that the right price has been calculated. And for a shopping app, that is a core piece of logic, right? Like if you get that wrong, your company can lose a lot of money, right? You might be giving discounts to people that shouldn't get them. And that's another thing, like try to identify the code that is really important to you, but is also kind of isolated in a way conceptually, uh, because that's usually a lot easier to test without having to go into these advanced techniques like dependency injection and mocking and things like that, which are also important, but that's not necessarily where you want to get started. Yeah, I find a lot of people are more interested in looking at the black boxes than looking at the functionality that they're doing. They're trying to make sure that every, every specific function works the way that function is supposed to, when in fact, they're all in support of a general concept and the concept's what's important. Absolutely. And I think also there's a lot of debate around like what's a unit test, what's an integration test, what's an end-to-end -end test. And sure, we can debate those labels and we can say that one test is an integration test or a unit test. But like you say, at the end of the day, we're trying to test the functionality that we're writing, that we're providing to the user. And it doesn't really matter what we call the test in the end of the day. Like if it uses one class or if it integrates one class into another and you can still call that kind of your, your unit test, it doesn't really matter even though it might technically be integrating one piece of code into another because you're testing the functionality as a unit. And you'd mentioned test-driven development, which is basically starting from the tests and then working back to the code to so saying something needs to satisfy this and this and this, and then you write the API around that. Um, I find that uh, a lot of people seem to champion that TDD should be either the primary, uh, TDD should be the testing you're using, or you should be using unit testing. And I disagree. I tend to find that in certain situations, you may fall back on one while still in the same project. 
Right, exactly. Like TDD is a is a technique. It's a it's a way of working, and、uh, it means that you can switch between doing TDD and non TDD many many times throughout a day. And like I mentioned earlier, I'm not a huge fan of TDD as that kind of holistic concept where you say this is just the only way to work, and I'm going to write everything, every single line of code I am writing in this project is. Written using test-driven development, because there is some code that leans itself or lends itself very, very well to TDD. And I have an example right now. I'm working on a static site generator for for Swift, like written in Swift, and I'm using almost exclusively TDD to work on that because it's a perfect project for that、uh, workflow, where I have a piece of HTML I want to generate, and I can write a test. That asserts that that right HTML has been generated for a given input, and then I make my static site generator work so that it can output that HTML. And the beauty of that is that as I add new functionality, as I keep going, I have all those test cases I've been building up. That every time I make a change, I can make sure that I didn't break something that I implemented maybe one week ago or one month ago. Uh, but at the at the same time, if I'm working on, for example, UI development, or I'm writing a view controller, that is not as easy to do like TDD style. You don't have that clear input output. You have, you know, all kinds of states, and you have user interactions. That for me, doing TDD、uh, for something like that is 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 a bit cumbersome. And there, I would rather just、uh, use the simulator, implement the thing I need to do, try out different parameters for something like an animation, and then once I'm done, I look at okay, what can I actually test here. Now, going back to、uh, the show that we had with James Dempsey, we talked about finding that one true path and trying to avoid just coding to success. I often find that in unit testing, we can do a lot of testing for not just the succeed cases, but making sure that we test around the fail cases. Yeah, absolutely. I love to test error handling, and one kind of hidden gem there is、uh, that you can make your unit test cases your actual unit testing functions you can make them throw so you can define all of your all your functions that are called like test x test y they can all be throwing functions and that way if you're using the do try catch pattern in your code and you are have functions that throw errors you can just call them with try from within your、uh, from within your test And that's really great because that enables you to both test the success case, like you mentioned, and also test the error case, where you can catch those errors and assert that the right error was thrown. Because, as we all know, like when we test our applications and we work in the office, we have great Wi-Fi, we are connected to a perfect server that is、mm-hmm. right, you know, running, running maybe in the same building. You know, we have low latency.、Uh, it can be really hard to to get all those different error conditions. And sometimes you open up an app and you see like. Error code twenty two, and you're like, oh great, what does that mean? <laughs> and、uh, if we can test those in unit testing instead, we don't have to spend so much time like manually going through like enabling all kinds of link conditioners on our networking. We can test all those things programmatically. So let's let's talk about UI testing, which is similar but a relatively different beast. How would you confront that? So I usually use UI testing、uh, as a way to do end-to-end testing, which means that I'm testing my code running locally on the user's device, all the way to how it communicates with the server. It comes back. You have user interaction. Like you're trying to simulate the user using an app in the field, like in real life. Of course, it's still a simulation, so you have to take that into account.、Uh, but I like to implement UI tests that are following that. So. I try to implement user journeys throughout the app. Things like signing in or creating an account,、uh, creating some piece of content. Maybe if it's an app that has that, like let's say it's a to-do app, creating a to-do item, maybe marking it as completed, making sure that all those things work. And one thing that I love to do here is that I love to use my analytics to verify that my UI tests work correctly. So. If you're building an app that has some form of analytics, you might be using an analytics SDK, or you might have rolled your own. What you can do is that you can enable your app to instead of sending those analytics events to the backend, it will instead present some form of UI, like for example an alert view. So if you have a, an event that the user's profile screen was shown, you will present an alert view that says user profile screen was shown. And then in your UI test, you can just look for that alert view when you have performed that action, 
And that is really great because number one, you don't have to implement all kinds of mocking and all kinds of automation features in your app. You can just use the analytics that you already have. And second, it lets you test your analytics because that's another thing that is really hard to test manually. Like your manual testers won't probably go into the like analytics database and make sure the right event was logged. And you can get all those things done uh, using a UI test. I like that. That's, that's a yeah. very, it's a great idea. I'm going to sit here and write down notes going, I like that. I'm going to use it. <laughs> and I also have an article uh, about this, of course, <laughs> which we can put in the, in the show notes uh, around how to uh, UI test using your analytics events. So we'd mentioned earlier on about third party uh, frameworks and how sometimes they're a good plan, sometimes they're overused, et cetera. But using them in you uh, in in a testing tends to sometimes hit a snag. Yeah, uh, it all depends on how the API is designed. Coming back to that topic of API design and just how important it is. So I see a lot of third-party libraries that are understandably designed a lot for convenience. You know, you want your your library to be easy to use. And what does easy to use mean? Well, most often it means let's use a singleton, right? Because if you have a singleton, you see so many SDKs and libraries, like when they have the first line in the readme, it's like, this is so easy to use. You just uh, create the shared instance or you just call upon the shared instance. You do the thing you want to do and boom, you're done. With three lines of code, you have now integrated this SDK into your app. And that's great. Like, it's really, really nice. It, it makes it very easy to get started. But when it comes to testing, like you say, it can put some, uh, some, some problems for you. So uh, why is Singleton so hard when it comes to testing? Well, I, 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 we talked earlier about how you're looking for those kind of functions or, or functionality that you can test by giving some input and then asserting that the right output comes out. But if you have a Singleton in there, you're going to have all this like shared state where it's not visible to you from the outside. You need to uh, for, find a way to like reset that singleton somehow, and then things start to get really messy. It, it's not so clean anymore. It's not this like pure function input and output. So I think that can be a little bit sometimes problematic where there's a conflict between a framework really wanting that really nice and easy to use API for production code, but it makes testing a little bit more difficult. Yeah, for my own code, I've basically put a whole bunch of models together that are uh, the base models for the entire app because it's used between a phone, it's used for a TV app, it's used for a watch app. So having it all compressed into one general framework makes things a little a lot more convenient for reusability. But then having that third-party framework as my model base becomes a little bit difficult for unit testing. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, like the, the key way to kind of get around this problem, because I don't want the listeners to, to, uh, to take this as never use third party libraries, because that's definitely not my, my message here. Uh, you should definitely use them whenever it's appropriate and uh, whenever they give you uh, more value than what you pay to actually implement it. But so how can you kind of use third party libraries, but still enable testability? Well, for me, it all comes down to abstractions and having those right abstractions in place between your code and that library. So we talked earlier about networking libraries. Let's say you have a networking library that you use. Well, you don't need to call that library directly from your own controllers, from your own model code and things like that. You could have like a little network engine or network manager or networkable protocol, whatever uh, fancies uh, your taste. And you can use that to call your networking. And that way you can, you can mock that in your tests and you don't need to even bring that third party dependency into your tests. You are completely in control now. And as a bonus point, whenever in the, in the far future, when that library of eventually gets deprecated or replaced or, or the API changes significantly, you can migrate to a new one because all you really have in your app is, is the connection point to that abstraction that you had. Yeah, I think that's a very important thing that, to, to remember is that when you're using a third party uh, library to have a stub level or a general connective level between that third party and you, because when you lock it in one-on-one, -on -one, you always run the risk of when it goes out of when the code dies, when it goes out of usefulness, if it doesn't get updated. Now, all of a sudden, you've got to completely unhook everything and possibly rewrite sections. If you've actually done an abstraction layer, 
that's when it's easier to basically say, well, I can plug and play that third party extension. I just need to redo the abstraction layer. Absolutely. And uh, it's also great for kind of separation of concerns where if you are only relying on that abstraction layer, whether you use functions or you use a protocol or you use some kind of class as an intermediate, uh, you are separating your concerns because ideally you don't want networking to be so core in your app that it just bleeds out into all your different classes and all your different functionality. And then at some point, like your table view cell knows how to do networking. You know, you, you want those clear separations and having those abstractions in place both kind of future proofs your code in terms of working with a third party dependency, but it also kind of helps you move more towards those clean lines of separation. I think one of the other things you have to be very careful of with third party frameworks is the concept of Apple always trying to expand its own OS. And that is that every now and then a perfect third party framework comes out that fills a hole that Apple is missing. And when there's something in the OS that Apple is missing, inevitably Apple's going to fill that hole in themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And that is a great role that third party libraries play because I'm sure that engineers at Apple look at the open source community and look at what's on GitHub, what's popular and take some of those ideas and, and implement them. What's commonly known as Sherlocking, right? <laughs> uh, I was, was going to use the term, but I decided not to this time. R right. Uh, I think that's great. I think that's really great. Like for example, there, um, very early on in Swift's uh, life, I implemented a JSON mapper like everybody else did back in those yep. days. <laughs> you know, there was like a thousand libraries on GitHub for mapping JSON to a model. And mine was called Unbox. And uh, eventually Codable came out. And Codable mm -hmm. took a lot of the ideas, not specifically from Unbox, but from the community in general. Like how do we create a good API for mapping JSON to a model and vice versa, and how can we integrate that into the compiler to make it all automatic? And at that point, there was a lot of people asking me like, are you sad now that, you know, Codable Sherlocked your library? And I said, no, absolutely not. I'm really happy. Now I don't have to maintain this code anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's all, now it's all in the standard library. It's perfect. So I, I think, think there's definitely I, a give and take there. I think the best thing to do if you're a third party developer who's written there, their framework in open source and Apple comes out and does something is try to reduce down your code to basically be an abstraction. Absolutely. And that way the people who've been using your code can basically say, okay, I, I don't have to rip out his code, but his code is now abs just a simple abstraction right into the OS that that's now available. And I think that's one ticket to basically say, well, a as a third party developer, doing open source stuff, I'm thinking ahead to how can my code still be of value to you, even when there's much better code out there. Yeah, totally. And it again comes down to those separations of concerns, because if you have clearly separated your code and you have these different modules, even within a framework, not necessarily like different sub frameworks, but different parts of it. Uh, if then an OS level feature comes out that kind of replaces parts of it, you can just like implement that part using it. And a great example of that, I think, is Vapor, the very popular um, oh, yeah. server-side framework, where they basically did a complete 180 when Swift Neo came out, the networking, a very, very low-level networking library from Apple, where they said, you know, we're actually going to just rewrite our kind of under-the-hood uh, functionality to use Swift Neo in order to, like, really build on that common foundation and still maintain like what makes Vapor great and what makes it like easy to use because it's more high level, but build on top of those, like not an OS level in this case, but an Apple provided uh, base. And I think that's really important about, third, about frameworks in general is that frameworks should actually come in tiers be, with a higher level version of the framework that does the, the, the gross level controls and then a secondary framework that does the finer controls. And I think you see that in things like scene kit and, uh, and game kit versus metal, where you actually can do some of that work on a higher level without getting into the nitty gritty. And Vapor does that with the fact that Vapor itself has this great API that simplifies that networking side of things. And then Swift Neo came in and basically Vapor was able to just take the abstraction layer and plug in a better system. Yeah, exactly. And I also love that you mentioned that that's a great quality of Apple's framework design as well, because 
I would say that's almost the best thing about the way that Apple's developer tools are organized is that you have that really nice different tiers of frameworks. You can pick the level of abstraction that is right for your project. So we talked about earlier, like, like, like sometimes there's a mismatch between the tool you use and your use case where you're bringing something that is either too low level or too high level or just too complex. But when you look at the way Apple designs their framework, like let's say you're building an AR kit app, you can, either use to, you can either choose to use the scene kit renderer, which is the default, or you can implement your own using something like Metal. You can plug core animation in there. You can even pl pl plug sprite kit in there. It all kind of composes very nicely. And I think that's a qu good quality of really great code, whether that is code that is local within an app or that's within a framework, is that it's composable. You can take a little part of it and compose it into something else to form something that is great for your use case. And going back to our comments about Codable and how Codable came out and finally filled that hole of JSON, again, as I, I mentioned, we're recording this about two weeks, uh, actually about a week before WWDC, but we're releasing the show after WWDC, so the best thing to do is go back and listen to the State of the Union piece. Uh, the keynote is always just to tell the public what the neat apps are that they built on all the good stuff that's underneath the hood. But all those new things that Apple has been putting in to fill in, go back and watch that State of the Union address because that's where you get to see all the specifics that are being added for the new OSs. Uh, I say go back because, again, that was about two weeks ago from when you're hearing this. Yeah, it's classic podcast time traveling, yep. <laughs> where the you know more than what we know, which is pretty interesting. In the, in this case, you know you've you've seen what actually happened, and we just have to to envision ourselves in the future now. <laughs> are, are you going out to WWDC this year? Unfortunately, not. I'm staying here back home, and the reason for it is that I am actually going to do a dedicated site this year for covering all things WWDC. So since we're time traveling here, if you also want to learn about all the different things that were announced and my take on them, you can go to www.bysandel.com, and there you'll find, hopefully, if, uh, if a future John does his uh, work <laughs> right, you'll hopefully find a lot of articles there covering all the things about WWDC. So that's what I'm doing this year. So it didn't feel like a good investment for me since I am completely independent. I you know, have to pay for my own tickets, my own hotels, my own everything. Uh, since I knew I was doing that dedicated site and I wanted to like really cover the conference in much detail this year, it didn't feel uh, like a smart move for me to like go to San Jose, spend all that money just to sit in a hotel room and write articles. <laughs> And of course, uh, uh, again, if, if Future Drew has done my job, then you will have gotten a chance to watch the uh, review of the keynotes uh, on, the sh on Monday after the keynotes. We will, uh, we will have had had been doing that. <laughs> Perfect. The, the yeah, that's the future impossible past never tense. Yeah, exactly. I hope that I'll be able to go next year because I definitely want to do something uh, like you guys are doing. I really do enjoy those podcasts that are like commenting on uh, the things that were announced while you are there because being at WWDC, actually being there is such a different thing. Like the atmosphere, all the people you meet, all the events going on, like it really is a thing of its own. So for anyone who hasn't been yet, I really do recommend going. Uh, I just had to take a break this year, but hopefully I'll be able to go next year. It's, a, it's an excellent conference. It's a great chance to network. And also one of the nice things at the conference, which is different than uh, seeing the shows or seeing the actual sessions on the, uh, on the app, is that they do have people there who work in the design team. They have people who work in the app approval team. And you can bring apps in process to them to discuss it, to see if there are things that they're, they suggest from an Apple point of view for improvement to make your app better either for the end user or better to be processed and approved by the Apple Store. Absolutely. And another thing that's so important about these events is the kind of quote unquote networking part. You know, not only that you are going there for some like you have some mission that you're going to connect with all these people, but just like, you know, finding out that guess what, the things you are doing and the problems you're facing, there are thousands of people around the world that are facing the very same problems as you. And just that realization of standing there, you know, surrounded by people who are like-minded, who you can talk to, who you can, like you say, you can go up to Apple people, you can get their take on something, you can get them to look at your app, give you some advice in the labs. 
that is just so incredibly valuable. And it also lets you, you know, get some new contacts and maybe stay in touch with some of those people uh, for the future as well. Let me take us back to uh, UI testing for a moment because we're, we've talked a bit about the reasons behind it, but I have a colleague who has a hashtag, or at least he used to use a hashtag, I love you Xcode, because Xcode <laughs> itself is a wonderful tool but can sometimes get in the way. Do you have any tricks or traumas that you've dealt with in Xcode when you're doing UI testing on a complex project? That is a really good question. And it's definitely something that a lot of teams are struggling with. Uh, some of it is inherent to the ways uh, UI testing work, where I mentioned earlier that for me at least, UI testing is all about that end to end. I try to not mock so many things. I try to not make too many things artificial because I want them to execute under more real life conditions. But that also means that you need to hit your network, you need to run through all those user flows, you have to watch all those animations, and that can take a long time. So if you start building up a test suite with you know, maybe 50, 100, maybe 200 different UI tests, things start to take a really long time to run. And there are some tricks you can do there, like you can speed up the animation speed, you can set you know, the speed on, on the core animation layers in order to make them execute faster. You could introduce some lightweight mocking where you might introduce some kind of local server that your app can talk to while it's running its UI test. You don't have to go off to the network all the time. But my number one tip around this would be to just, again, break things up. You know, if you are working on a big project, you have many, many tests and you want to write UI tests against many different use cases, you can have many different UI testing suites. You don't need to have one that is just like my app UI tests. You can have UI tests for your login screen. That is like one UI testing bundle. You can have one bundle for your profile screen. You can have one for, you know, if you're writing in some kind of editor, the editor screen. And the beauty of that is that with some little little scripts here and there, maybe on your CI, your continuous integration server, you could more selectively run tests that are uh, matching the functionality that was changed. And another thing that I love about this approach is that you could even introduce a UI testing target that is called development UI tests. And there you can put UI tests that you are working on right now. And you can use UI tests almost a little bit like a script in order to navigate through your app as you're working on it. So if you're working on a screen that is like really deep down into the hierarchy, you need to like select an item in a table view, then you need to scroll down, select another item. That's boring to have to do that like 50 times a day in order to test the layout constraint. You can just automate that using a UI test, automate the navigation there, and then you could either choose to commit that UI test as part of the change, or you can just throw it away once you're done. But in general, splitting things up is such a great way to make things faster because you can parallelize them, you can selectively run them, and also just to manage them when it comes to like a really large uh, set of UI tests. I, I, I never even thought about splitting up the UI tests into separate bundles. I always have this monolithic view of, you know, I have my application and then I have my application's UI test target. So that's actually a really fantastic concept there to work from. And I, I'm probably going to beat on my app later this weekend for that same idea. Nice. Again, it depends on which phase you're in when you're working on your project. If you only have five UI tests, it's completely fine to keep them in the same bundle. And that's how I always start out. But it's, it's once you reach that point where it starts to hurt, you know, when it starts to, you have to wait for 20 minutes in order for all these UI tests to complete. That's the point where you probably want to, to start splitting things up and modularizing them a bit more. One more quick point around just like stability and scalability of UI tests is the way you perform your assertions. So when we're writing unit tests, often we can write tests in kind of a highly synchronous fashion where we're performing some actions and then we're performing our assertions. But when we're interacting with our app and especially since UI tests are running in a completely different process and kind of sending commands back and forth, we really need to be very generous around timeouts and not making the assumption that one element will immediately appear on the screen. So there we can use, there's APIs for waiting for a certain element. You can use some expectations in order to give your app some time to actually process the thing and perform its networking. And that way you can really reduce flakiness because you don't actually end up spending all that time waiting if the data comes back faster. It's just that you give your app that like little bit of a, a uh, little bit of a relaxation in order to have that time if it needs it to perform those actions. So you don't need 
just so you don't end up in that situation where you have that flakiness. The expectations do an amazing help when it comes to working with closures or completions. Absolutely. And when you're working with UI tests, basically all of the tests are like that. <laughs> all of them are, you can, you can treat all of them as asynchronous. You can treat all of them as they will have some waiting time baked in. Uh, but you don't want to wait unnecessarily. You don't want to start like sleeping in your test code, right? You don't want to put like sleep five or something because that will always wait. Instead, you want to use expectations and you want to use that wait for elements uh, API that we mentioned where you are waiting until a certain element appears on the screen. And the expectation code may seem a little tricky at first, but it's one of those things that once you've done one or two, and there are lots of wonderful tutorials online on how to use expectations in XC, uh, that it just comes rather naturally. And like anything else, you just start throwing them together very, very easily. Yeah, absolutely. John, this is really great information for testing. UI testing, unit testing, there's uh, the ability to know that because there are different ways to do this testing, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're caught in one track. There's so much that the end user has available to them that I think that it will enrich everybody when it comes to what they've been doing and what they can do with testing. Coming up in the second half, we're gonna talk a little bit about UI and UX design and how things tend to not always go smoothly for the developer. But first, we're gonna get a message from TripleByte, our sponsor for the season. We'll be back in just a moment. This RayWenderlich.com podcast is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume, you spend hours and hours on phone screens, take home projects, and that's assuming the company even responds to your interest or your cover letters. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies, from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them, and if you do well, you get to go straight to the final interviews with the companies on their platform. It's like the common app for software engineers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. And I can appreciate that. Being in the industry for 35 years, I'm entirely self-taught. My undergraduate study was in theater, and I left school to do my first job. So I don't carry a bachelor's, no bachelor's of arts, no bachelor's of science. And that's the one thing I'm often trying to hide or misdirect on my resume. With TripleByte, they'd care more about the coding experience that I have and not worry about that one little fact. Apply now at triplebyte.com slash Ray. That's triplebyte.com, byte. B-Y-T-E, as in 8 bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through TripleByte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. And another thanks to our sponsor, TripleByte, that's B-Y-T-E, uh, for sponsoring this episode today on May 25th with John Sundell. And we've been discussing unit and UI testing, uh, the good, bad, and ugly. Uh, for the second half of our show, we'll bring in Drew to talk about his experience with UI and UI testing. See, now, it's an interesting thing that the average person doesn't know how to code, but everyone thinks they're a UX expert. <laughs> right. No one will ever tell you which data structure to use in your app, mostly. But everyone can tell you that that widget is in the wrong place on the screen and should work like something else. But I used to think that this was annoying, but now I remember that everyone thinks they're a UX, exper a UX expert because UX is user experience. So why shouldn't they have an opinion? I came to the realization the line comes when the user tells you, how to make the UX rather than what they want. And I think this is a consistent through all of programming is that we don't want the user to tell us what feature to put in. We want the user to tell us what problem they have to solve. Yeah. And UX is, can be a nightmare on any level for the end programmer. I was working for a company doing what was effectively a module launcher. This was at about the turn of OS 10, meaning we had been writing in the pre OS 10 world and we wanted an OS 10 app for our bundle of applications. And the application I was writing in complete cocoa, because that's what we referred to an OS 10 app as back then. Right. 
was a launcher and you basically could roll over different buttons and see what that specific module did and you press the button it would launch the app i like to tell people that this app was 95 percent ui and five percent code and as a result this app went through 37 iterations i know i counted <laughs> wow and the biggest reason on that was nobody liked the color <laughs> right <laughs> you see our company had two colors a uh, sort of dark color and a sort of powdery light color and the artist decided that the general wash of the app for branding purposes should be in that light powdery color which everybody thought was disgusting now this was such a bad disaster of an app that one PM didn't like the way the functionality was going and went behind my back to another programmer to get code to do what he wanted in the app. <laughs> oh my I will goodness. say that my manager backed me on that one because I've never seen my manager or any manager look like they were ready to deck someone else for doing something like that. But let me, let me, uh, let me back up and, and talk about being a designer and an artist and being a mobile designer and artist, because there are two very different worlds to so just being able to somebody who does art and somebody who does design for a mobile application. I had an experience with one company where we got graphics for each of the pages slowly and each graphic used a different version of the colors. I, I asked my designer, can you just give me a color palette or a list of specific colors we're using? And he said, well, just look at the graphics. That's where you get the colors from. And I finally got an XD file from him. It's a, an Adobe application I'll talk about later. And I took apart the XML file underneath it and said, look, you, you've given me 96 different similar reds. <laughs> the oh entire goodness. spectrum of red. Every, he says, I've only given you one red. And I, I, I would basically get pushback from him in meetings saying, I've only given you one red. And I put the printout down at the meeting saying, here are the 96 reds in your file. Which one should I use? Wow. How did that meeting end up? That, I, that didn't end up well. <laughs> but I, I think there are certain things that you need to expect when you're doing the design of your app that really a designer needs to have under their belt or you need to be able to, as a developer, handhold them through that process, uh, one of which is wireframes. Yeah, I think it's really important to remember that the end user doesn't really care or know, you know, what was a design, what was code, what was implemented by whom. Uh, it all comes together as one product. And I think it's important for us to keep, in, keep that in mind when we're working on a product where, you know, there doesn't have to be that very cl clear cut line between design and development. And rather than looking at it like, you know, as developers, we need to say to our designers that you can't do this, you can't do that because that will be hard in code. And the same way for designers to go off and design something really crazy that will be super hard to implement. I think it's really important to live in each other's worlds and to really go a lot back and forth when you're working on something. Uh, because that really builds a lot of empathy between the different fields and it also ends up becoming a better product when everyone knows what the constraints are, both in terms of the visual design and the, the branding and the colors we're going for, and also the constraints in, in terms of technical you know, decisions or limitations and things like that. So I think it's really important that you have that constant exchange between what are we doing in the code, how are we structuring the code, how are we structuring the UI, and how are we designing the, the application? What are we thinking going forward? What's our design vision and things like that? To have that constant communication between the team. I, uh, I've learned a lot of what I need to communicate with the designer from two very disparate experiences. And one was working with a designer who really had no mobile experience whatsoever. Uh, 
And secondarily, working on my own pet project for the past four years where I am the sole person doing everything. And I, I have to assure people, I'm not an artist. <laughs> About well, if you make art, you're an artist, right? I think I that ev everyone is an artist in some capacity, but maybe you're not a graphical designer, right? I'm not a graphical designer and I'm not a good artist. I make art that's, that's there. So one of the things that I really discovered was my need to learn more about either vector graphics or very, very, very simple non-vectorized graphics because when I'm trying to shrink something down to the different sizes that I need, if I don't have that easily shrinkable, it becomes very distorted. Um, if you've put graphics into an app, you know that for iOS at least, you need different resolutions of those graphics. I know as far as Android, it's, it's like, what, 3,000 different resolutions? Oh, yes, <laughs> it's even more than with iOS in my experience. So vector graphics are very helpful. <laughs> We're getting close to that on iOS as well. We're like chasing you in terms of number of devices. It's like, here's five new ones. Here's, here's a device without a home button. And here's a device with a notch, you know, like the, oh, yeah. that both iOS and Android are in a very similar position right now that you really need to have things be very scalable. Like if from the smallest little device all the way up to, especially if you support the iPad or even the Mac, you know, all the way up to a huge screen or tvOS for that for that matter or Android TV you know you have apps running in the car on the watch there's so many different contexts so having those scalable assets I think is incredibly useful in order to improve iteration times yeah I think my app icon which I did up in 1024 is reduced down to roughly 22 to 25 different resolutions for everything from the app icon appearing on the watch through glances, notifications, uh, setting screens, all the way up to the display in the app store in case it becomes featured. Right, exactly. Got to prepare for that. That's important. <laughs> if my app becomes one, one day, I'll be just I, I may just die of a heart attack right then and there because this app is not for a large audience. <laughs> but you will have the app icon for it. <laughs> I will have the app icon already for it. When I my think... 35 users say that this should be a featured app. <laughs> <laughs> you are prepared. That's awesome. But... Uh, I, th I think an important point here that we're kind of uh, hitting at is, you know, if we need those assets to be scalable and we need them in all of those different uh, sizes and maybe even different colors or different contexts, it's almost impossible for a designer to know all of those things upfront, especially if we're supporting both iOS and Android, maybe other platforms. So I mentioned earlier about this, like living in each other's worlds. So rather than putting all that pressure on your designer to produce those perfect assets with those perfect dimensions that you just assume that they know about, because of course they've read the human interface guidelines, right? And the, all the app icon sizes and things like that. I think it's a much better approach to install Sketch on your computer, install Photoshop, install whatever tool they are using to produce those assets and learn how to export. And a lot of designers these days are using Sketch, which is a wonderful tool for developers as well. You can make things exportable. It can, you can export them into any size you need. You can even script it. You can have plugins. There's a lot of things you can do there. And that really helps when it comes to lowering those, those obstacles when it comes to getting all those assets. Yeah, the two apps that I've become very fond of are both, uh, besides Sketch, are XD from Adobe, which we started using in its beta form. Uh, it's a wonderful wireframe slash, you know, just positioning elements on the screen app, but it also lets you page through them as well. So you can create almost an animated walkthrough of your app. The other one I use is uh, one called App Cooker. Nice. That's a great name. <laughs> and App Cooker is basically not just a, a design app, but it actually lets you understand the concepts behind your app. So you can talk, you know, there's a page that deals with the concepts of your app or the sections of your app or the monetization of your app so that you can see, well, if I charge this and I have this many users, how is that going to look? 
Nice. And uh, App Cooker yeah. also has a secondary app that when you run it through App Cooker, somebody else can run your app or at least the sort of wireframes of your app. But um, talking about some of those things that you really want to work with your designer on, because we talked about them not actually being familiar with things like the, the human interface guide is, well, for starters, giving them copies of the human interface guides or any other thing that shows them different resolutions. Because a lot of designers design for one size and the one size fits all concept doesn't work because you have to say, well, what happens if this spills off the screen or what happens if I need to go wider or thinner? Yeah. Yes. They need to learn the principles of kind of a floating design, an adaptive design. Yeah. The yeah. adaptive design is definitely the best term for that is talking about, you know, don't tell me that you want this 10 pixels from the left and then the next thing 50 pixels over. Give me proportions. Yes. Yeah. One important point also, I think, is that it really needs, in my opinion, to be a two-way street. Like, oh, yes. we can't just look at this like we as developers need to educate our designers about, you know, how iOS development really works or how Android development really works. Uh, it also needs to be us uh, kind of informing ourselves about uh, the way they work and the, the the principles they're going for. And, you know, we talked earlier about the way I write articles and how I'm trying to always get to the underlying principles of a different technique. I look at designs the same way where in order for me to work really well with a designer, not only do I need to show them kind of what the constraints are and what we're talking about here when it comes to like human interface guidelines and things like that, but I also really want to understand what their principles are and what they are going for with the design because that also makes, makes it possible for me to sometimes make decisions on my own that I can then show to them and chances are I will be right because I have understood the underlying like design that they're actually going for. So things like colors and fonts and spacing, I can often improvise because I've kind of gotten myself into that world. Wow. In my experience, we didn't have a designer. So I worked for a small company where we made mostly utilities that were business oriented and the appearance of them was secondary to their practical purposes. Uh, but the one thing I did learn from working with someone who is very good at both UI design and programming is the usability was the most um, important aspect because he could take something I had built and rearrange it to be so much more usable and intuitive. Um, and he ended up taking most of the stuff off of my interface. So, and I can relate a lot to what Drew said about um, you, people who think they're good at UI want to add features. I am guilty of that because I would put all the features, try to cram them all onto the screen. Um, and my other coworker would be like, oh, well, put this over here. These are the things you do the most. Um, so those principles were really important to learn and have helped me in all my designs since working for that company. That's well, awesome. I, That's I, really I think cool. as, a, as a developer, you always want to have every tweakable feature tweakable. You always want to have a little button and a switch for everything you can change. And I, I, uh, I, I remember saying, well, well, for the user preference screen, shouldn't we be able to give them preferences into everything? <laughs> and, and I was course, guilty of that. And of course, the user's like, well, I don't need to know how to change that. It's like, it may be why dark mode has taken so long to come around. It's like, well, we never thought that the user might want to change that. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, you really want to strike that nice balance between giving them something that is opinionated because you as the creator of something and that can be the collective you, you know, if you're working with a team, uh, you have an opinion about how this problem should be solved. Uh, but you definitely need to also like listen to the users and see what problems are they actually solving and what, what do they want to do with this application uh, and also provide the right amount of flexibility so that you can cover more use cases and more preferences. And also this really ties into things like accessibility, right? Where if your app does not res respect things like their preferred uh, text size and whether or not they want motion on and off, some people just won't be able to use the app at all. And I think all of those things kind of tie together when it comes to, you know, bringing together really good design. And that's the classic like Steve Jobs quote, right? That design is how it works, not how it looks. And I think that's so true when it comes to these things that, yeah, sure, we can bolt on features, we can make everything configurable, or we can make nothing configurable, but it's all about how it works and what the users are actually trying to do with the app. 
the uh, the relationship between the designer and the developer also can be a wonderful check of power because in both cases this is a place that feature creep can always come in yeah totally <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know i now want this thing to have this kind of animation for this it's like well does it need to actually animate the yeah exactly I that think is one good question <laughs> to ask yeah. often. A great example of that, uh, the, this last year or so, ever since Apple introduced the new redesigned App Store, where they made these like cards that animate super nicely out when you tap them, so you navigate into these stories and they take over the screen with this super cool physics-based animation. Uh, I've had so many customers and people ask me how to implement that and if I can implement that specific animation for them. And when I say that, you know, that's like a week of work or something because, you know, it's a really specific, really, really well-optimized, fine-tuned animation. Sometimes, you know, they, they think you're crazy because <laughs> it looks so simple, but it takes so much tweaking. And like you say, there can be so much feature creep trying to get that right animation going. While if you just would have opted for something maybe a little bit more basic, at least for starters, you might have just been able to solve a lot of other problems instead of just like, getting that animation just right, even though it can be really fun and also really rewarding to get that really nice animation going. Yeah, it was really interesting for uh, one of the apps that I was working on, I was asked to replicate an animation that's similar to what you find in iBooks, where as you turn the page, the page itself curls, and underneath the page, you can see sort of through the paper to a reverse version of the page as you're turning it. Right, exactly. And, and my mind immediately went, well, that's metal. <laughs> and I don't do metal. At least I don't have enough of a knowledge of metal. And I'm researching and I'm trying to find, is there an API to do that? And I can't find an API to do it. And I'm trying to figure it out. And then I get the most horrifying news possible is I find, well, no, Apple copyrighted that. They trademarked that transition. Wow. Because they use it in iBooks and they basically pioneered how to use the code, but they copyrighted that whole thing. And I'm like, well, now I've got to go back to the boss and say, well, I don't know if I can use this or I don't know if I can replicate this for you because they own a copyright on it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But you can get at least a part of that effect using UI page view controller. But perhaps you were going for... Uh, something a little bit more specific to what they're doing in, in Apple Books. Sometimes they will use those classes from the SDK that gives us you know, a part of that, but they will build on top of it. Yeah, I, I really think that, uh, that this was, I, I tried to use that page view controller turn transition and it, it was not close to what I was trying to get accomplished. Right, exactly. But yeah, and that's, a, that's another one of those things that we, we need to have an open dialogue with the designers on is transitions. And that is that you don't just simply say, I'm gonna press a button and something else will manifest. Do things slide in, do things fade in? Do they, how do they, how do these things occur? Yeah, exactly. So it, within design, like in development, there are many different kind of disciplines or different types of designers. So there used to be in the app development world, you would maybe have like your UX designer who would like create wireframes and flows. And then you would have your actual UI designer who would like actually draw the pixels. Like especially in the old days, like draw those nice wooden panels and those shadows and those big frosted glass and all those skeuomorphic things. Uh, no but now... Uh, we have a third a really important genre of design, which is motion design, which is what you're hinting to there, mm -hmm. uh, where it's also equally important, especially now as designs have been really scaled back in terms of kind of visual fidelity or in terms of, of detail, that motion and depth and things like that are so much more important than they were before. So really thinking about those transitions and, and implementing them in a ni nice way, I think is, is really important. And again, it comes back to like looking at what is available on the platform. What can I implement in a pretty nice and easy to use way? And you can use things like on iOS, UI dynamics. You know, you can use the different animation options to give your animation that nice springy feel. But again, you need to go back and forth with whoever's doing the motion design to, to say, okay, here are some tools that I have at my disposal. What can we build with them? What can you come up that will we'll use those tools? And then sometimes you build something custom. Sometimes you drop down to metal if you're really, you know, if you're, if you're into that. But a lot of the times you can, you can use a lot of those standard APIs, again, if you have that back and forth uh, in the beginning with your designer. 
And of course, then you've either got that situation where you're dealing with three designers, the one doing the wireframes, the one doing the graphics, the one doing the motion, and they're all turning to you, the one developer working on the iOS stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or the flip side, like I said, I, you know, when you do your own projects and suddenly you have to play the role of all of those things all at once. You have to wear many different hats. Yeah, you have right a whole, whole, whole uh, wardrobe full of hats. You know, right now in the project I'm working on, I've discovered that there's a section of my app that needs to have consumable in-app purchases. And you know, along that line of you know, the, the games that have currency, you basically have X number that you can use until you can purchase more. And all of a sudden I discovered, well, where do I put that in from a UX point of view? How do I notify them that this functionality now has limited usage? Good right. question. Is it documented in the, is, you know, the guides anywhere? Well, fortunately, the, it's for uh, journaling. So you only get so many journal, journal entries before you have to purchase more. So fortunately, there was room underneath the, would you like to journal this button to put a little number that says you have this many left. Oh, great. That sounds slick. But uh, yeah, just I, I remember because I've said on the show many times that even though I'm a sole developer working on my own project, I'm actually using Agile from a schizophrenic point of view where I play multiple roles. <laughs> <laughs> actually, nice. Have you stand up with yourself? I, I, I do stay to myself. <laughs> it's interesting too because I'll actually tell myself I want to put a new feature in and then I'll say, I'll stop myself and go, okay, is this feature creeping? Are we going to hit a deadline if I put this feature in? <laughs> you should definitely start live streaming those stand ups. I think that would be hilarious to watch. That would be funny. <laughs> that, that, that is tempting. Uh, I, I've tried, uh, I'm reminded of uh, an episode of Doctor Who where the doctor has met several other incarnations of himself and he looks at the other two and he says, you know, this is what I'm like when I'm alone. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I can relate. But and one thing with the Apple does, uh, I'm trying to publish an app right now and I'm trying to do a non-renewable subscription and they rejected my app because I didn't get that UI pattern just right. The functionality is there. So the app works and it has you renew the subscription, but I'm supposed to have another dialogue in between or I have to match their pattern more exactly. Yeah. So I got rejected and it's not documented anywhere. So I found other people who'd been rejected who could enumerate what they wanted. Um, but it'd be nice to have some pictures in the guide. <laughs> Maybe I'll publish an article afterwards. There is a good series right now on raywenderlich.com on dealing with the in-app purchases that Brian Moakley did. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Oh, great. I used that to build my app. So that was before I was a writer with Ray Winderlich, And I was so thankful for that article series because I could not find that information anywhere else on the web. And I was, um, it got me all the way to where I'm this close to publishing. <laughs> So they just didn't like my dialogue box was all, or the order that I sent dialogue boxes out. But yeah, I think it, I think it's really important to understand that when you are dealing with the designer, there needs to be that back and forth dialogue, because the designer is not a programmer, and theoretically, as a programmer, you're not a designer, and there needs to be an understanding of each other's world. As John mentioned, I think that's a very important thing to point out. Yeah, absolutely. And there needs to be respect for the other person's craft, right? Where, you know, like you mentioned in the beginning here to the segment is that everyone, you know, can sometimes play the role of a designer, right? And I think, I think everyone can be a design critic, you know, like, you know, this, this is a good UI, this is a bad UI, etc. because you have your own personal experiences with those. But really trying to set those aside and, and really trusting also uh, the person that you're working with to, to make the right calls. And of course, validating those through things like in different iterations, maybe do beta tests, bring people in, ask them for feedback, things like that. But to not constantly be giving your designer notes as a developer, I think is really important because again, you know, you're looking to, to establish a really good working relationship where you have a lot of back and forth and respect for each other. And, uh, I think just like having respect for the work that you do is, is really fundamental to that. Yeah, you need to put an app into people's hands and the further they are from maybe your focus audience, I find is often the better because they don't have expectations going in. I know I've, I've actually passed my app off on Jen 
and, and I know I'm pretty sure that Jen is not my primary audience for this application and she's taken a look at it and I haven't gotten any comments back. So I assume it's perfect at this point. <laughs> oh, I just, I'm going to take it down to my old coworker who's good at UI design and have him take a look. So I just haven't had time to, to digest it, but it's um, very cool. I like a lot of the features on there. I like how you put it together. So I think it has a um, really fun potential for your target audience. Yep. And I will take it down to my friend who's really good at um, seeing uh, where you could simplify UI designs or, you know, he seems to see obvious things. He's an out of the box thinker. I'll take it I'm in trouble. I doubt <laughs> it. I don't know. So it looks pretty good to me. So I thought I'd take it and I thought I'd take it down to him and see if he could point out stuff I'm missing. <laughs> As UI is not my strong suit, come to find out. I'm much better at back-end coding. Actually, to, to put you on the spot now, Jen, the nice thing is coming up in two weeks, we move into our Android episodes. Oh, boy. Yay. So, so uh, instead of me talking about my projects, we'll have Jen talking about her projects. More on our next episode in a few minutes. But in the meantime, I really want to thank John for being on the show today and helping us out with a uh, discussion on testing and also discussion on, on UI and UX and the nightmare that that can be and how to make that a lot easier. John, I really, again, want to thank you for your time today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It was a lot of fun to be on the show. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for, for having me on. And that's going to wrap things up for this episode. We want to once again thank Triple Byte, that's Byte, B-Y-T-E, for sponsoring this and every episode this season. In the meantime, as we say, that wraps things up. We go back to the Emerald Castle. Ray, back to you. And that's a wrap. Thanks again, everybody, for listening to the RayWendelk.com podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget to leave a rating on iTunes. See you next time.